joining us at the 2020 90 targets update hosted by IAPAC. I'd like to thank the pre-conference organisers for inviting me to introduce this session and its speakers. I'm Anton Pozniak, President of the IAS. This is going to be a really fascinating symposium addressing the questions of what can we measure to understand that the HIV epidemic is in decline? How can we measure the progress in reducing stigma and discrimination associated with HIV? We're going to hear about the vital role of community who are essential in data collection and analysis, in research and in monitoring, and how this leads to effective advocacy and change. Our first speaker is Peter Gies, Director of the Strategic Information Department at UNAIDS. He leads the department responsible for generating strategic information and analysis that increases better understanding of the state of the AIDS epidemic, the progress made at national, regional and global levels by bringing together different sources of data, methodologies and stakeholders. Dr. Gies has been with the UNH since 1999, working in a number of capacities focused on the analysis of the global AIDS epidemic and effective responses. He's a physician and epidemiologist and holds a doctorate in medical science from the University of Antwerp, Belgium. Peter will talk on metrics for HIV epidemiological transition and for monitoring stigma and discrimination. Thank you. Our next speaker is Solange Baptiste, who is Executive Director of the International Treatment Preparedness Coalition, ITPC. She leads community activists and allies across the globe to deliver ITPC's mission to enable people in need to access optimal and affordable HIV treatment through treatment education, demand creation, community-based monitoring and interventions to make medicines more affordable. Solange has over 15 years of global program management, advocacy and monitoring and evaluation experience. She has a Master's of Science in Population and International Health from the Harvard School of Public Health. Solange is committed to ensuring that the voice of effective communities contributes to and influences the decisions and policies that affect their lives. Solange will now speak about Community Data Matters. Thank you, Solange.
Hello, this is uh, Peter Gies speaking. I will be speaking about the metrics for uh, measuring ep epidemiological transitions and also metrics for monitoring the, the, the de decrease in stigma and discrimination. My name is Peter Gies. I'm with uh, UNAIDS in Geneva. So as a background for this uh, presentation, I thought it was good to remind ourselves that uh, the current framework for the AIDS response is uh, set by the sustainable development uh, goals and within that there is a specific target for uh, as it relates to the AIDS epidemic. And so that target is for the year 2030 and it says ending the AIDS epidemic by that year, by 2030. Then as it, as it uh, is uh, more uh, close and maybe more practical because there is targets for different programmatic elements. There is also importantly the 2016 uh, political declaration, uh, which was agreed to at the UN in the year 2016. And it has a lot of uh, programmatic targets within it. And then the last element I wanted to mention that is specific to this uh, uh, presentation and discussion is that there was uh, in 2017 a specific meeting to discuss uh, epidemic control and epidemic transition. And I will refer to that a few times in this uh, presentation. So first I would like to speak about the metrics for measuring uh, transitions in epidemiology of HIV. And so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the sustainable development goal actually has uh, identified an indicator to uh, measure the, uh, what it wants to achieve. And so that indicator is actually the incidence of HIV per 1,000 1, uninfected people. Then uh, in addition, the meeting that I made reference to earlier that spoke specifically about metrics for measuring these transitions, it identified two additional uh, metrics. One is the ratio of incidence to prevalence. And so in practice, this uh, divides the number of new HIV infections by the total number of people living with HIV. And secondly, the meeting also identified another uh, metric, which is the incidence of, uh, the ratio of incidence over mortality. And so this divides the new HIV infections by the uh, total deaths uh, occurring to people living with HIV. And so that includes both deaths that are occurring because of AIDS specifically, but also deaths due to other causes. So then as uh, UNH has been uh, reporting these measures since uh, I think two years now, and so at the regional level, which we're looking at now together with the global in the top left corner, we see that uh, there has been um, quite uh, some progress in terms of incidence prevalence ratio, where we have seen that uh, declining over time. So here we, we look at the time between 2000 and 2018. And we also see that there is some uh, champion regions that actually are closer to the target value, which is indicated on these graphs as uh, 3%. And so some of those uh, champion regions are the West American region in the middle of this uh, graphic. And then also the East and Southern African region, which is shown at the left uh, bottom corner of this, uh, of this slide. So at the same time, we also see that some regions really are not close at all to the target value of 3%. For example, in the top right corner, we see the Eastern European and Central Asia region. And so we see that, um, you know, that region is actually very far away from reaching a 3% uh, IPR. And similarly, we also see that the North uh, or the Middle Eastern and North African region is in a similar situation where it is quite far away from the target value of 3%. So then let me just uh, speak a little bit about interpretation of that uh, incidence prevalence ratio. 
So I mentioned that it divides the number of new infections uh, by the number of uh, people living with HIV. The benchmark, as I mentioned, it is 3%. And so it does uh, indicate a shift in the epidemic where um, you know, when countries are uh, below that benchmark of 3% are actually on a good track to uh, continue to reduce the epidemic. And um, and so the, the benchmark of 3% also, you know, it is based on a, an assumption that uh, people with living with HIV on average are going to live about 30 years with HIV. Of course, this will vary by region and country and also according to the age by which uh, people are infected with HIV. But as I mentioned, it is an average over all of those quantities. So then if I go next to the incidence uh, mortality uh, ratio, which we see here uh, displayed again by region, um, we actually see that uh, it has uh, additional properties. So the uh, target value for that incidence mortality ratio is actually unity or one. And so that is also indicated in this uh, slide as the yellow line. And so we actually see that some regions like at some point, they, uh, uh, countries in that region were below the target value of uh, 1% and then increased after that. So there's actually several regions that uh, display that uh, behavior. And so uh, maybe in the next slide, I will just uh, speak to why that happened. So, the, um, so I mentioned that the indicator is the ratio of the new infections, new HIV infections. That's to people living with HIV. And so the indication or the meaning of that indicator is that once uh, um, a country or an entity is below that, uh, um, that uh, threshold value of one, that we're actually looking at a shrinking epidemic because it, it will mean that there is uh, um, uh, less new infections um, per uh, people uh, that are that are or there's less sorry there's less new infections than there are people dying of uh, HIV, and so this uh, the perverse uh, qu quality of this indicator is actually that when uh, HIV mortality or mortality uh, occurring to people living with HIV is is uh, high because of uh, uh, low um, treatment you can actually end up with those perverse uh, uh, situations where you're dropping below one. And that is just because a lot of people are dying with HIV. So it is really an undesirable um, feature of this indicator. So um, because of that, people have suggested that this indicator should only be used together with uh, indicator that reflects the ART coverage uh, among people living with HIV. And uh, specifically, people have suggested that uh, the treatment coverage should be at least uh, 81%. The 81% reflects uh, 90 times 90% uh, is uh, 81%. So let me then move on from those uh, two metrics for measuring uh, epidemic uh, transitions to uh, metrics that have been developed for uh, looking at the reduction of stigma and discrimination. So first of all, to recognize that there is like a complexity of uh, different elements included within this uh, stigma and discrimination. And also there are several tools that exist and several uh, uh, survey questions within those tools. <clears throat> So, uh, and then also to recognize that uh, the um, data availability, of course, it, it, it varies across countries and situations. So first of all, let me uh, indicate that uh, here we are looking at uh, um, data from uh, uh, population-based surveys that ask people, all the people in a country, you know, how they feel about uh, people living with HIV and specifically whether they would buy vegetable, vegetables 
from somebody that they know to be living with HIV. And so for a large number of countries on the left side of the, of the slide, we actually see that there is like important reductions in that, uh, uh, in those discriminatory attitudes that exist uh, among people. But then on the right side, so see that it actually, or there actually is also in each region pretty much some countries where we actually do not see that decline or where we see uh, or actually an uptick after having seen a decline for some time. So then next, uh, um, we're looking at, uh, again, similar uh, data, um, but this time based on, uh, um, on, on, is also data from uh, population-based uh, surveys. And so we see that across uh, all countries, pretty much there is actually very high levels of uh, discriminatory attitudes that continue to exist um, across the different regions that are shown in this uh, slide. Um, next, we are looking at uh, information from uh, specific surveys that are conducted uh, by people living uh, yeah, by people living with HIV, but also among people li living with HIV. So the instrument is called uh, the stigma index. And so we see that uh, across a number of countries, we actually have uh, like um, evidence of uh, stigma and discrimination that exists uh, with different uh, elements of, um, you know, stigma that occurs in healthcare uh, facilities. And so we, you see on the slide here that for four different uh, elements that can occur in those healthcare settings that we actually see uh, important levels of, uh, of uh, stigma that occurs. So then next uh, is uh, specifically to key populations. And so we see on the right of the slide that this deals with data from uh, sex workers uh, gay men, other men who have sex with men, people who inject drugs and transgender people. And so the data here comes from surveys that are actually conducted in these populations specifically. Again, we see that uh, a large number of, uh, of people actually avoid healthcare because they fear stigma and discrimination at those uh, health facilities. And we see that it is actually extremely high for some countries, but then in pretty much all countries, it does exist at varying levels of uh, of prevalence of that uh, of that uh, like avoidance of healthcare, as it says. So the next uh, element that I also want to speak to is that in many countries, uh, um, criminalization continues to exist, and so this is uh, the slides actually shows criminalization for different uh, situations of population. So we have on the very left, transgender people, then we have sex work, then we have um, uh, drugs possession or consumptions, and then we have uh, transmission. And the final to the right is uh, same sex uh, sexual relationships. And we, so we, saw, we see in the, like the bright part of the circle each time we see how many countries actually have laws that uh, um, that criminalize those behaviors out of the orange circle, which, re which represents the total number of countries for which this information is available. So then maybe coming to the end to say that, uh, as I mentioned, there is like a variety of, uh, of, of uh, like information uh, and data that exists around uh, stigma and discrimination. So there has been an effort since the meeting that I refer to, the meeting back in 2017, I think it was, that looked at, uh, at these metrics. That meeting actually recommended that um, metrics for epidemiological transition should always be presented together with information about uh, stigma and discrimination, uh, recognizing that the two are, are much related and that somehow the stigma and discrimination reduction will then also allow further progress with uh, epidemiological indicators. And so the, um, a recent uh, consultation actually in, uh, identified that uh, different domains uh, could be included in summary measures because people recognize that it would be useful to have like a summary measure as it may 
be clearer uh, what a trend actually is in that reduction of stigma and discrimination. And so the different domains uh, are listed here, social norms and attitudes, laws and policies, violence, anticipated and also experienced stigma and discrimination, internalized factors. And so we're actually at UNAIDS, we're like uh, quite involved uh, in uh, trying to come to these summary measures. And so uh, um, results are expected soon uh, for this. And so bes besides the domains that are listed here, there is also recognition that it would be useful to have those um, values around stigma and discrimination reduction for different populations. So with this, I would like to my uh, presentation and hand to our other presenters in the session. So thank you very much. Good day, everyone. My name is Solange Batiste, and I work with the International Treatment Preparedness Coalition, known as ITPC. Uh, this segment, as Anton said, is defining new metrics for HIV prevention, treatment, and stigma. And I'd like to thank uh, IPAC and UNAIDS for inviting ITPC to present uh, this pre-conference on the 1990-90 targets update. I will speak today about community data matters. Uh, in preparation for this presentation, I was thinking about, you know, as people in general, what is our relationship with uh, data and metrics and measuring things and how do we um, feel about it? Do we trust it? And I think we all have an interesting relationship with, uh, with data. Um, to an extent, it really has to do with how you look at it. I mean, one can look at this and see a flat pie chart, or you could see the sky and the sunny side of a pyramid and then the shady side of the pyramid in the darker brown. And it also has to do with what you want it to say. If you twist it, if you torture the data enough, they will confess to anything, as it says there. And then this uh, little comic strip from Dilbert says, you know, I didn't have any accurate numbers, so I just made up this one. Studies have shown that accurate numbers aren't more useful, any more useful than the ones you make up. How many studies show that, then asked someone, uh, and he says 87, which is obviously made up. So, you know, it's all about our general relationship with this art and this science that is data and modeling and setting targets. Um, but I wanted to think about this now in the context of the HIV response. When we look at the HIV response, 
And we think about targets, we think about 1990-90, the catchy slogans from UNAIDS. And then we also think about like these heat maps that are presented here and these graphics on the left-hand side of the slide and line charts and these bar graphs and pie charts, essentially thinking about numbers and percentages and coverage and how well are we doing in terms of numbers of population size. And this kind of data is traditionally generated from academic institutions who are doing research projects, um, quote unquote, on um, people living with HIV and, and populations of communities. And then we also think about governments who collect data through the uh, public health system and uh, aggregate that data up to the normative agencies like the WHO and UNAIDS and other UN agencies to then say, well, this is how a country is performing. These are the results of a country in handling its uh, HIV um, response. However, I don't think we've done as well, and there's less focus on developing metrics for measuring, say, quality. Uh, qualitative data is less um, focused upon, and community data is really lacking. Uh, we do not usually use a community lens when we decide to do uh, determine research projects or design research projects when we're looking at monitoring and also about the community uh, insights um, where we know that is, is sorely lacking. So I'm going to now walk through a snapshot, a snapshot of ITPC's experience um, and looking at research, monitoring and advocacy, which has been community led. So looking at community led data and when communities lead, what do you get? What are the benefits? Because many people will say, you know, communities could come alongside and they could join and collaborate or communities, you know, that their, their place is to, you know, just do community interventions, you know, kind of do things locally, but they shouldn't really do uh, research and monitoring of what service providers should be providing and then, and they should stay in their place. But when communities lead, they own the process, they own the data and they own the results. Um, communities have a vested interest in the outcomes. And so, you know, you don't have these projects that take forever to end. You actually have something that is quick to the point, gets at the root causes and is, you're able then to intervene locally subnationally, nationally, regionally, and even globally when you think about this kind of data. The data also doesn't vanish, meaning it's just not used. It's not sitting in some dusty book that has been published and, you know, the, the deliverable was met by a consultant. But this is actually a process that is owned by the community. And in doing that process, you also see that there are other benefits, like the community systems are also strengthened. So, the whole body of communities, including community-based organizations, um, gain these benefits through the process of leading this kind of intervention, these kinds of interventions. Um, the, uh, staff develop skills in data management and M&E and advocacy. Organizations build uh, their program track record in, in order to be able to gain uh, the attention of other donors and get uh, uh, further funding. Um, and that is, you know, all part of community system strengthening. When communities lead, you also get appropriate and responsive interventions, right? You get things that are appropriate. The solutions are closer to home, closer to where the issues are happening. It can be reactive. It can be an alert system. It can be something that, that really responds to the need at the moment. And it could be a longer term sort of trend that you say, okay, this is the change. And we actually look driving at a policy change. Community led interventions generate more valuable and honest to an extent insights in to address their pressing needs. Um, you can argue that who asks the questions make a difference in terms of how true the answer will be. Um, to one extent, you can argue that, you know, a pair asking another pair, for example, in a key population context within HIV, why you don't come for a service, they might be more willing to be honest and open about why they may not be coming to, to a particular clinic or what are the issues they're having or the, the challenges they're having in, in, be, in being able to access a particular service. And when communities lead, you also get action and accountability focused results. So these results are to be used to make change. People do not want to waste time doing something so that you could say it was done. 
data collection and analysis is for a purpose. It is not an end unto itself, right? It is directly linked to advocacy and targeted action to improve quality and service delivery, and also to hold duty bearers to account. And these are the reasons why, or these are some of the reasons why ITPC make it, ensures that the work that they do, that we do, is focused on communities leading the process. When we think about what we collect, these are just a few examples listed here on the quantitative side and the qualitative side. If you look at the HIV treatment cascade from prevention all the way to viral suppression, we look at not just sort of the traditional indicators that are already being um, uh, captured in the routine um, uh, information systems and M&E systems, but really what are those indicators that are relevant and important and key to communities? It's as in you think about the number of days to get the viral load test result, <clears throat> but you might be able to capture that in a routine monitoring system. But what we want to know is the number of days to get the viral load test result to be used by the clinician for decision making about your life. How long does it take for you to get that result in use? for you. So we're looking at different kinds of things. And on the qualitative side, we're thinking about the why. So why do you prefer this service? What are the reasons for not coming in for the HIV test? You know, what was the nature of the interaction with your healthcare provider? What are the reasons that you were told why there was a stock out or, um, you know, the, what are the barriers that you are facing in accessing specific services? So really getting those inroads and those insights on, on the qualitative side. And that part is often missing in the holistic HIV response and the data therein. When we look at our community treatment observatories at ITPC, we have two uh, most recent examples that we could draw upon. This is our Global Fund project in uh, 11 West African countries, the RCTO, and then three countries in Southern Africa, Malawi, Zim Zimbabwe, and Zambia. Here we're collecting, and are we meaning community data collectors, pe people living with HIV networks and their leaders, and key population network um, and key population leaders. Um, within the HIV space. These are the ones doing the data collection. The collection is paper and mobile uh, in, in the Southern Africa um, project. And so this is qualitative and quantitative data um, collected at these monitored facilities. So what's the kind of data that we're talking about? So just another snapshot of the sort of big data in the hands of activated communities. We're looking at in this particular project, 11 countries, two years of monitoring, about, you know, 1,700 quantitative reports, but, you know, 143 focus groups, and then you can think of the insights that you gain from those, 1,500 interviews, you know, 81,000 viral uh, tests performed, and, you know, about 105,000 people on ART, which is a representative sample size for the entire region, and therefore the insights that you can gain from these particular monitored sites are relevant and uh, reliable. So looking at the actual results that I wanted to, to show you, um, I'm not going to go through the details of each one, but really to say in the first row, figure one, two, and three, so red, purple, and blue, you're looking here at things that we want to see decrease. We don't want to see stockouts of ARTs. We don't want to see stockouts of supplies for uh, viral loads in the lab. We don't want to see um, high numbers of days for the actual length of the stockouts. And so the general trend here in these monitored facilities was that it was going down. And this is community-led data monitoring, right? This is community-led monitoring. The communities were able to put in interventions once they were able to see that data. And over time, we can see now that things were improving by um, these numbers going down. And conversely, on the last row, uh, figure four, five, and six, so the brown, the blue, and the green, Things that we shouldn't be increasing are increasing, right? The quality of care, the viral load tests performed, the numbers of those, and the viral load suppression should be in, in um, improving. And so we see that trend going upwards. So this is an example of the type of data that you get from community-led monitoring. This slide is also from this particular project, looking at the relationship between access to viral load testing services and the viral load suppression uh, data in the monitored uh, health facilities. And here we see of those who received a viral load test, uh, less than half 
of those, 48%, were virally suppressed, far lower than the UNA's estimate of 73%. And this is an interesting slide to me always because, you know, this begs the question, to what extent can community data challenge academic data that comes from traditional sources? And how can you use community data to triangulate and say, well, okay, something has to be wrong here and let's investigate, let's double click on what's happening here if they're so vastly different. Another example of um, this kind of community-led work is looking at the surveys. So um, ITPC has conducted a global treatment access survey, which is the first one, this global survey and access and to and quality of HIV care and treatment. Uh, this is the um, map of the world where it was um, an extract from the publication looking at seven regions, 14 low and middle income countries, and looking at quantitative data, qualitative data, again, community data collectors. Missing the Target is another initiative under ITPC where we're looking at access to HIV services in this particular series among people who use drugs in Pakistan and Kyrgyzstan, uh, quantitative data, collection and qualitative data collection with civil society actors, healthcare workers, and key stakeholders. But the point here is central to designing the research question, figuring out the methodology, conducting the research, and doing the analysis and the publication is the community. And so the results, a few extractions of the results from that kind of work, this one here is coming from the uh, missing the target report. Oh, sorry, this is coming from the Global Treatment Survey. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of this, but you'll see on the y-axis here, HPV, HCV, HBV, TB, and STIs. And just to look at one, so let's say TB. The WHO, this was in 2017, the end of 2017 into 2018. So by then we know that WHO was recommending that all people living with HIV be tested for TB. This should be fully green. This should be 100%. Only 77% of the participants reported that they were asked about TB symptoms and offered a test. That should be 100%. This graph should, this line should be fully green. And look how bad it is for HPV, half, more than half, seven, it's the flip, 70-something percent, 73 percent, um, never were tested for HPV. So we see that many sites do not have the capacity to screen for comorbidities. And this gives you an insight into then what are the interventions that we need, what are some of the priorities for advocacy that we should be uh, making um, come to rise to the top Another thing that was um, alarming was stigma. Stigma remains a pervasive and deadly barrier. This is coming from the survey, the global survey again. Uh, two thirds of respondents experienced an episode of anticipated stigma in the previous 12 months. And more than a third of respondents, this is almost 40%, experienced an act of stigma in the previous year. So they actually experienced stigma. And this is, this is just worse for key populations. Uh, members of key populations, especially vulnerable to stigma from healthcare workers, uh, is what we found. And MSM and sex workers reported denial of health services significantly more than the general population. We're talking about 6% and almost double of that for um, MSM and sex workers. And internalized stigma was about 60% for respondents. They were, they were um, reporting uh, issues of self-blame. For HIV status, um, decisions not to have sex, decisions not to have children, just because of that fear and the stigma that was internalized. Again, showing us insights and nuance into where and how we should be intervening uh, based on this community-led intervention. So all of this only matters if it is used. Right, The data must be used. Collecting the data in itself is not the end goal, as we had said at the start of this presentation. Uh, any insights really need to be able to um, address the gaps identified through critical advocacy. The resources we've listed here, are just a few pictures that I've put of some um, ITPC publications, illustrate ways in which the data was used to bring about change, which is literally the advocacy. 
Um, if you look on the left hand side of the slide in the puzzle where it's blue, green, light blue and gray, we start with education, right? We know that you cannot um, measure something and track something that you don't understand or don't know. So we move into a place of understanding standards and look for the gaps. So that education component is critical as a precursor to doing research or monitoring or gathering evidence. Once you get the data and you have the evidence in front of you and you've gained the insights, you now actually move into the advocacy piece. And that's the point of this slide, which is really to say that data only matters if it is used. The last part of the puzzle, which is often left out and not thought about, is engaging. And that is about the co-creation of solutions, is about sustainability, is about bringing partners together to be able to complete the cycle. Because once policies have been changed and matters have changed and improved, then you have to go back into the education component again and move through evidence, advocacy and, and engagement. This slide is really looking at the critical role of advocacy. I'm presenting an example from the RCTO, the Regional Community Treatment Observatory work that was conducted uh, in West Africa. This is in the country of Benin. This is a success story looking at how community data generated from the um, monitored facilities was able to alleviate stockouts. So Ribat Plus is the name of the uh, PLHIV network in Benin. And they here were able to take their data um, that showed that there was stockouts of reagents to the National AIDS Control Program and use the CCG, which is the Community Consultative Group, something that's sort of analogous to the CCM uh, in the Global Fund um, model, where this group is a multi-sectoral uh, stakeholder group and they all sit together, they look at the data, they discuss the issues, what is emerging and what should be actioned. And here they had success, the uh, feedback mechanism for the CTO worked, a solution was found, and this particular hospital was restocked with uh, reagents and they tried to address that problem immediately. This final slide in terms of looking at the importance of advocacy and the role of advocacy shows the regional uh, advisory board in October 2018 coming up with a list of advocacy priorities based on the data that was generated over the past two years from the RCTO West Africa data set. And they organized their advocacy priorities by the 390s. So the first 90 in terms of people being able to know their status, they prioritize, okay, you know, we need to expand the availability of non-facility based HIV testing options based on what they've seen in terms of numbers of uh, people who know their status. They need to increase the demand for um, testing services. Um, the second 90, uh, which is about people who know their status will be receiving sustained ART. They think about, they prioritized um, supply chain to prevent stockouts. They're looking at um, the need to enhance linkage to and retention in care especially for key and vulnerable populations. And the last 90 talking about uh, viral suppression, looking at the adequate, the need for adequate viral load uh, testing machines and lab supplies, um, enhancing knowledge among PLHIV and healthcare workers to increase demand for uh, quality HIV, sorry, viral load testing services, and um, to ensure effective treatment monitoring through acceptable turnaround times for viral load test results, which were really not good in this region. Um, so these are priorities which will then inform where we should focus, how budget should be set, what kinds of interventions should take place. And so this is really critical for the region to be able to see this and then also at the country level, that level of data. I'm now on my last slide. I've titled it Setting, Chasing, and Reaching Targets. Uh, put a little funny picture there of the guy is running after a chicken. I'm not quite sure if anybody's ever actually chased after a chicken, but it's not that easy to do. And there in this picture, you know, blinders on, they have decided that the chicken is their target. They're going to go, you know, full speed ahead and attain and catch and get to this chicken. Um, now, just thinking about this analogy and looking at the HIV response and where we sit um, and thinking about, you know, what is our ultimate measure of success? What is what is that thing we're chasing after? And I think everyone here will agree that we're chasing after healthy people. 
maintaining a population that is healthy and keeping people healthy and with a good quality of life. And so when we take a step back and we think about, okay, well now, how do you set targets within that context? Part of that is, uh, you know, target setting has always been aspirational. It gives you something to chase after, whether you're a human being, a community, uh, you know, or a country um, or global targets. Um, but it is much of an art as it is a science, right? So it going back to my first slide where I had some of those jokes, it depends on what you want the data to say and how you quote unquote manipulate it. Um, it's just one side of it. And then there's the very, you know, grounded, very serious people um, who will say, yeah, it's a science and it is only a science. Um, you have models, you have assumptions, you get all these numbers, but then they agree that it's not just numbers. You need to think about things like, you know, structural and legal and socioeconomic, uh, political enabling factors. And then you will get to this point in the conversation where you talk about, well, there's a need for everyone to attain it. So we need more stratification. We need more granularity. We need to understand what's happening for each age band and each population. And are we are we getting there for everyone? And then you get to this point in the conversation again, where you think about estimates and, uh, you know, well, we make an, the, our best estimate, you know, based on, you know, the population side. But we all know we have denomination is, denominator issues. We, we are not quite sure because it's an estimate. If you think about uh, population estimates, for example, for key populations, uh, it's it's definitely not a true reflection. We've seen many studies that have shown that they, the, these denominators are not exactly accurate. So then what is this target that we, quote unquote, have reached? And this leads me to my question, which is in red. When we reach a target that is not well set, have we been successful? We often hear things like, well, we don't have that data. We will never get that data. It's too hard to get that kind of data. That data is impossible to get. If we get that data, that's a miracle. Can you tell us how to get that data? Well, you know, I don't really have the answers, but I'm, I would like to suggest and offer up my last two thoughts, which are that we maybe we're not looking in the right place. We're not necessarily equipping the right groups to help gather more of the necessary data. We need to cast the net wider and start to think more broadly. Community data can help to get more accurate estimates and ultimately inform better targets. My so this is my real last slide. <laughs> um, I wanted to end on an inspiring picture. Uh, this is a picture set in Sierra Leone. This is the people living with HIV network that's hosting this um, adherence club, um, but they're doing it in a socially distanced way. They have taken the initiative to um, make sure that they have, you know, adequate spacing uh, between the chairs. They're doing it outside, so there's proper ventilation. Um, you know, they're not all wearing masks, maybe because they don't have the the um, protective equipment, but they're doing it outdoors where there is sun, and so you see that. This is just to drive home the point that the future is community led. Communities are not going to wait to be asked to join the table. They are going to take the initiative. They're coming up with the innovations necessary to take care of their own people and their own lives. And so as we think about the targets that we need to set for the next, you know, the next iteration of our thinking and the HIV response, we need to make sure that we understand that communities have a central role and they are not going to wait to be asked. They are going to lead us into the future. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for your time and your attention. We look forward to your questions later on. One. Oh, thank you so much, Solange, for that. And uh, we're now going to have uh, some question and answer session. Please send your, uh, the listeners, uh, please send your questions through and we'll try and answer as many as possible. Uh, Peter, I, I'd like to start with you, actually, and just um, talk about this incidence prevalence ratio number. Now, in COVID, we've all been told about this R value about transmission, and I know this is slightly different. But is this a metric, do you think, that fast track cities are going to use, countries are going to use, or we just we should only rely on it for the global epidemic? Um, thanks for that question. Very good question, Anton. So uh, I think that, um, you know, the metric has been uh, defined and uh, has uh, definitely used 
and it can be used like at different uh, levels of uh, of of, of uh, you know that you mentioned global, but also country. It can also be uh, used at uh, at city level. As one goes uh, like uh, lower into the disaggregation, of course, one has to deal much more or think about uh, migration effects as to whether like your numerator moves more than your denominator, et cetera. But otherwise those are like uh, metrics that uh, have been in existence now for uh, I think about two or three years. Um, in the upcoming uh, UNAIDS report that will come out actually at the start of next week, we will see some uh, information about that, how uh, different regions again are doing. I showed some of that up to 2018. Um, as well as some countries that actually are achieving, uh, you know, are achieving the threshold for uh, for those uh, for those metrics. And to come back to the first uh, element of your question, so this metric it is uh, somewhat related to the R value, um, and of course the one big difference between uh, COVID uh, infection and uh, HIV infection is just the duration over which we are looking where the incubation for COVID is very short, while for uh, HIV it is actually very long. Plus with ART, fortunately, people are living very long lives. So it just makes it a little bit different, but like the essence of the metric, I think is quite similar to the R value for COVID that people have spoken about. Yeah, and uh, of course, IAPAC, who are running this symposium, have got the fast track city. So maybe they get, may, maybe start adapting this metric, which uh, I, I found extremely useful. So thanks for that. Now, Solange, the, uh, I'd like to just come to you about who should be measuring what. So there is a problem with the comorbidities. And I understand uh, why we might be measuring TB and HIV. But whose responsibility is to, to measure how many of our patients have got hypertension, diabetes, and other non-communicable diseases uh, because you could say that could be the responsibility of other organizations and not overburden the HIV community with having to do so much because we always step into the gap, don't we? We always do. So uh, what, do you, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think even we're seeing now with COVID that um, most of the HIV sort of... Um, uh, actors are at the front lines of the COVID response. And so I think that's just the nature of uh, the HIV response. I think there are many lessons and things to be learned. With respect to comorbidities, I mean, I think it's it depends on how you look at it. I think it's a, I think from a community perspective, a recipient of care, they, they don't care who is owns the responsibility. They want the service. It's a right that they are supposed to have a right to health. So um, I think it's this question of thinking about the health systems holistically. We've always talked about integration. We've talked about people coming in and even right now with COVID where they, the symptoms are quite overlapping with TB symptoms. It's kind of obvious that we need to do these things. We've gotten fancy terms like differentiated service delivery and trying to gain efficiencies in the system. But I really think that the onus is on all of us. I mean, do what you can within your local context to provide the service that is needed to people um, and that can save their lives. And just talking about the R value, I think just to say, I think it's only as important as it furthers the understanding of the community about transmission from our side, because there's a lot of communication that if not connecting with communities is just a bunch of noise. So what does the R value actually mean in terms of protecting myself, protecting my family and others? Yeah, I yeah, know it's uh, this, this communication of technical specs and metrics is, is essential to get down to a level at which everyone can understand them. Uh, I, I just want to get back to some of that, Peter. How do you, in your metrics, get differentiate between stigma measurement and discrimination measurement? Uh, because in, in um, you were trying to show us that there might be an overall view, but but they can be extremely different, can't they? They can be they can be very different in very in different countries. Yeah. So thanks for that question, Anton. So I think uh, you're right that they can indeed be different. That is to say, like uh, I don't know, stigma could be low, but there could be a lot of discrimination to people living with HIV. But I think that maybe the bigger like uh, 
hampering factor has been that there, like people can see so many of these expressions of stigma and discrimination and people can be a bit lost as to whether the world is making progress or a country or a community is actually making progress versus just saying, oh, it's high and therefore people are not sure, oh, was it always high or is it just now increased to a high level? And so I think there really needs to be some effort to uh, try and consolidate this information so that the world can be a bit clearer as to whether progress has been made. And uh, like we certainly recognize and uh, I uh, give kudos to uh, Solange to, uh, to speak about that, that uh, you know, it is important and increasingly important to see the stigma and discrimination also reducing because if it doesn't reduce then well, those other metrics they can never also be successful or reflect success. Yes, yeah, Solange, what do you think about this differentiation? Because uh, it's it must be extremely acute when you're in the community feeling one or the other or both. Yeah, I mean, the data that I re referred to in the presentation was a global treatment access survey. And as, as I said, I kind of expected um, more information about, you know, viral load test return time, but no matter how you twisted the, the responses from people, the pervasive barrier was stigma. And I think it really has an impact on people entering into care, um, into initiating treatment, and then staying on. Um, I do think that stigma is very different from discrimination and often that nuance is, is, is masked and lost in the big, big data. And I think one of the benefits of, from IAPAC and even the fast track cities work is kind of make things localized. Let's just pick a city and in, even within that city, let's keep it local. And what are the interventions? I think what we've learned over the many years of, as ITPC is that they need to be tailored. Interventions and in stigma are really hard. I don't think that data changes someone's beliefs, like if you give them more data and say, look, lives will be saved if you stop being rude. It's not going to change their literal way of being. So even, and from the other side, like help seeking behavior, like, no, if you go, you might save your life. They're like, I prefer to stay away. So the question would be really how to get pair led services, how to ensure quality and communities mean, being able to monitor that because the system doesn't self-regulate um, over time. Yeah, so, so it comes really now to, to Peter to, uh, to continue this little conversation here, which has got such big implications, is that uh, your, your group will do a lot of measuring. What about the, uh, the proposed interventions? Obviously, you, <laughs> you have to work with community on these, absolutely. Uh, but uh, and UNAIDS 2025 targets report, uh, is, uh, we'll be having some uh, implementation, I would think, ideas in there but how, how does that work? Right, so uh, first of all, let me say that yes, uh, like um, I mentioned in the presentation that a lot of the targets today, they're actually for 2020. So today we are in 2020. So it just naturally calls for like what is next. And so we think that it is useful to have like uh, intermediate time point between uh, today and 2030. And so naturally that has become a, 2025. So we've done some work on uh, developing those targets. And so one thing that uh, has been clear to me and it has been clear in the process of developing those targets is that there needs to be a lot more attention for uh, targets for social enablers because today a lot of people are paying attention to targets for incidence and mortality. And yet that doesn't like fully capture uh, the response that needs to happen, which also needs to address uh, stigma and discrimination, gender factors, etc. And so as it comes to the interventions like with, within our organizations, as I think maybe in other organizations also, there is actually like part of the organization that is more involved in the, in the action that actually uh, is meant to drive down the stigma and discrimination. Also, some of the big organizations in the AIDS field, including PEPFAR Global Fund, they have their own like units that also work with interventions and actually implement those interventions. So the, the targets that are, are being proposed are actually closely linked with uh, current thinking that exists around what are the interventions that actually allow um, you know, that stigma and discrimination to, to be reduced. 
So Solange, uh, hearing that, do you think that donors who are going to embark on programs, I mean, it seems to be an obvious question to answer that, that should absolutely take into account the, the community data before they, uh, before they move forward. In other words, uh, how, it's two questions here. How much do you think the community data is being, being listened to? And secondly, do you not think that it should be a prerequisite that community data should be part of, of any response? Yeah, so you, should, you know what my answer would be there. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, but I think we have a lot of work to do with respect to community data, right? Because uh, I think community data as a whole has not been respected in the field. Uh, I think the HIV response more takes things about the traditional players in that space, like academic data and researchers. Um, and it's easy to criticize and say, well, community data is not valid, it's anecdotal, it's not real, that was just once off, it's not really a trend. Um, but how much are we investing if we believe that they are the center of the response and where the investment needs to go? How much are we investing to strengthen their ability to be able to get that data and the related advocacy? Um, it's easy to criticize, but is another thing to actually put investments there. I think the other thing we need to do is try to normalize. Um, we need normative agencies to say, yes, this is what it is, define it. Um, we've been pushing with UNAIDS, PEPFAR, WHO, Global Fund, to be able to say, please help us to get definition put into some sort of normative guidance document what community monitoring is and what it is not and as you say is a prerequisite you cannot move forward you shouldn't have any national m e system without some community data you need to be able to see triangulate and you know in a sense you must get data points from all perspectives i mean even if you look at the private sector that's that's kind of obvious but here we just say oh no you you've got your service you're good um, can we get the missing voice amplified? Yeah, and I, I might just ask now then, uh, before we close, Peter, the UNAIDS have done quite a lot of work on social enablers for to move forward and mm -hmm. to try and uh, uh, take into account what Solange has just said. I don't know if you wanted to comment about that uh, and about how we might see that, you know, that this social enabling uh, becoming more and more part of, of what we're going to do in terms of action plans. Right, so... Uh... Um, like two answers to that question. One is that, uh, you know, in the forthcoming work about uh, targets that, as I mentioned, there will be a lot more space for social enablers and specific targets for specific elements of that. So that should be useful for the response overall. And then my second answer is maybe directly to uh, Solange's question for uh, standard setting to say that there is actually today like a draft document that tries to describe and define what, what uh, community uh, led uh, monitoring is and how it operates and how it can address like different uh, entities and take different forms. So we are working on that and it should be available also very soon. Okay, well, I'd like to thank you, Peter Gies, Solange Baptiste for wonderful presentations and for also epitomizing what we what we do at this uh, International uh, AIDS Conference at uh, AIDS 2020 Virtual is to bring people together to discuss really important issues. I'd like to thank IAPAC for putting on this pre-conference and, and helping us discuss this really important issue of metrics and community data. And I wish you both well in your endeavors and pursuits uh, in us trying to stop um, uh, eventually and absolutely once and for all the AIDS epidemic. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you.